Welcome to the place inside. The place for alternative news. The place where the unseen, consciousness, science, and spirituality meet. The place where human beings who want to take action have an appointment. The place inside with your host, Lawrence Galliano, an intellectual, musician, a spiritual teacher, tarotist, and writer. You are now entering the place inside, the home of the metaphysical freedom fighter. Welcome to the place inside. This is your host, Lawrence Gallian, and tonight we have episode number nine, which we're tentatively calling Enki's Laboratory. And we are excited and fresh back from doing a, uh, a wonderful TV show at a station called Planeta 2013. It's broadcast right out of Mexico City. It's completely in English, and I was their guest yesterday. And if you would like, you can still watch the show. It is archived. I'd be much appreciative if you would uh, go and uh, take a look and listen at the program that we put together. It, it was um, it was a lot of fun and it was interesting. And hopefully, they're going to have me back. So we have a lot to discuss with you today. Enki's Laboratory. Enki first brought to the public's attention through the famous Zachariah Stitchin, who referred to these places that we're going to talk about in his books. Apparently, Enki's Laboratory, or some say Enki's City, has been discovered in the countries of South Africa and Zimbabwe, according to Mr. Michael Tellinger. Enki's laboratory and city are so huge that it actually encompasses two countries. And this was Enki's original gold mining operation on planet Earth. And it seems to be scattered across South Africa and Zimbabwe. The area is larger than any urban area today. They are discovering literally millions of stone circular structures. Uh, they are obviously hundreds of thousands of years old. And as I just mentioned that Zachariah Stitchin referred to these places in his books. Uh, so a heads up there if you have not read Zachariah Stitchin yet. Well, that, that's mandatory. Now, you know, much of the information that we have is encoded in movies. A lot of really big secrets are given out in films. And uh, that's why I urge you to go out to the movies. Even if the movie itself sucks, it can contain very valuable information. Now, actually, this all started way, way back with the Shakespearean era plays, in which the very famous Francis Bacon put out coded information to the public that could never be stated openly or publicly, but he coded it into his plays. Many people who are in the know say that it was Sir Francis Bacon that was actually Shakespeare. No matter where you stand on that debate, the fact is that there is incredible information that was encoded in these Shakespearean era plays. And now today that we have film, there is information encoded in film, in, in movies. Uh, there is a saying, hidden in plain sight. In other words, planning a continued control of the human race. These forces that we have talked about, they are very concerned that if they fall back too far behind with their control system, 
systems and you know now that their control systems are often religions, various cultural social groups. We've got various royalty that is happening in various countries. We've got the triumvirate happening of London, Vatican City, and Washington, D.C. So they know that if they fall too far behind with their control systems, there's going to be too far a gap between what the average person knows and what these warlords know. Okay, so they, they don't they don't want you to know too much. And these movies are encoding and putting out valuable information for you. And they do not want you to be paying too close attention to this. And that's why I want you to pay attention. And that's why I'm encouraging you to pay attention to it. Now, no matter how much power these extraterrestrial warlords have, they cannot stop the growth of our DNA. This energy that's coming to us is really light. It's congealed light, otherwise known as matter. This whole energy matter dichotomy really isn't a dichotomy, that it's really the same thing, just like life and death. All, all physical matter, for example, comes from certain frequencies of gamma ray light. All physical matter. However, things like this you will never hear on uh, any other program except something like The Place Inside because the public has been dumbed down. The left brain prison system. Now, what is it with this RH negative blood? This is something else that you won't hear spoken about. And the scientists don't want to talk about this either. This is some huge genetic anomaly that has not been told to the public. The scientists don't want to address it. The fact is that part of our DNA comes from an off-world source. And scientists don't want to even touch this subject. RH negative people tend to be more sensitive, generally speaking. Also, a higher percentage of RH negative people claim to have been abducted by aliens than that of RH positive people. Now, please read more about this. You can Google, put this as your search terms in Google, strange facts about RH negative blood. And you're going to get some very fascinating hits in return for your efforts. Strange facts about RH negative blood. We know that this Earth has been a laboratory for extraterrestrials. Where did our DNA really come from? Who is the main source for it? Well, you know, the Sumerian tablets make it very clear that the Anunnaki created the slave species to do the gold mining. They created a primitive worker, our early ancestors. Now, how did our early ancestors evolve genetically? That is one question we need to ask. There's clearly been a lot of cross-pollination, except, of course, for the royals who keep, or who try to keep, their gene pool very clean. Now, have you ever thought about the fact that we are fascinated with gold? Everyone wants to wear gold, right? What's with this garbage bling bling thing now? I can't stand that, but I have to mention it because we're on the topic. Think about it. Why are we so programmed to adore and love gold and be willing to pay a huge amount of money for it? To be willing to kill for it, steal it at a great risk of a long prison sentence and 
just ponder that for a moment. We are fascinated with gold. Why do women love it when their boyfriends or husbands buy them gold? Obviously, it has been programmed deeply into us to seek for gold. Hmm, very interesting, huh? We were originally created as the original, quote, gold diggers, unquote. And many of you have heard that term about people who are just interested in you for how much jewelry you can buy them. Well, very interesting, that term, gold diggers. And it is said that we were created genetically to dig for gold. We were made to dig for gold for the so-called gods. And I have a bone to pick here with this term gods. Um, I, I want to make it very, very clear that when I use this term gods or goddesses, Generally speaking, I am using it with a small g. This is just when I'm speaking about it, and I can guarantee when 99.9% .9 of the authors and speakers out there who are talking about it are speaking about beings with what seem to be superhuman, supernatural powers. This is not a reference to their spiritual development, okay? Because some people are going around and saying, ah, the, the gods, the gods, you're talking about deities here. No, no, no. It's, it's just a race of beings with technological sophistication. But getting back to us, we are obsessed with gold. In Genesis 2, before God creates Eve. Now check this out. Before God creates Eve, God tells Adam about a land that is rich in gold. Interesting. Before he creates Eve, God tells Adam about a land that is rich in gold. Obviously, this supposed divine creator of the universe has some connection with gold, wouldn't you say? We must separate the God with the big G and the God with the little G. The little G God is the God of bad energy, fear, vengeance, capturing and keeping slaves, and so forth. The God with the big G is infinite love. Now, I don't want to get religious, and we've spoken about this here. This is not a religious program, but we will from time to time be talking about spiritual topics. Anything negative has come out of the belief of a momentary separation with the divine. And this is really an insane thought, for nothing can separate us from the divine, all right? So maybe it's best if we, if we get rid of this word G-O-D and use terms such as ultimate reality or divine reality uh, and so forth. I mentioned the laboratories of Enki. Yes, he worked and planned and plotted, but the human beings had their laboratories and science too. They called it alchemy. No, not the idea of turning lead into gold. That idea was just the dying last gasps of a once great and powerful spiritual science that the metaphysical freedom fighters had on their side. One very fascinating fact about life, not just on this earth, but life in general, is that it takes place on many levels. Think about the Hermetic principle, okay? As above, so below. And as below, so above. And as inside, so outside. 
and as outside, so inside. These hermetic principles are so powerful to meditate upon and just to think about it. I'm going to recommend a book to you now, The Kabbalion. That's with a K, K-Y-B-A-L-I-O-N. If anybody turns you on to this book, you have to thank them for it. All right, so I expect some thank you notes in my email. Read The Kabbalion. It's a very slim book, and it is worth every cent that you'll pay for it. There are so many levels to life. Any one action, any one fact contains innumerable levels. It is said by the Sufis that you need to read the Quran at the seventh level to truly understand what it is saying. Other Sufis say 70 times seven levels. So to all the great pantheons of the gods and goddesses that each culture had, these deities were real in their own way. They were real in the sense of being powerful, unconscious forces in the mind of the human being. And I feel really a strong intuition to say that again. So they were real in the sense of being powerful, unconscious forces in the mind of the human being. And they were real in the sense that they were the working terms of a science that makes our science today pale by comparison. After the last cataclysm about 12,000 years ago, this sacred science of alchemy degenerated into mythology. And then that mythology concretized into religion so that it can no longer flow. Many of the world's old religious beliefs are really the remnants of a doctoral level physics textbook. We think these beliefs are one thing, and it turns out they are something completely different altogether. Some of you laugh at the naive innocence of these ancient cultures believing in such little g gods and goddesses. Or you spend Friday nights with your friends doing role-playing games engaged in battle with these gods and goddesses. Or perhaps if you are a neo-pagan, you have an altar to one of these deities, and perhaps you have a circle ritual in which you worship these ancient powers, uh, then you would spell the god and goddess with the capital G. Yes, you do sense that they are very powerful, but you feel this deep inner frustration that you just can't seem to get them activated in the way your intuition tells you that they can be activated. Do you feel that frustration? I know I have in the past, and I believe you do too. Many people on our planet are worshipping subtle principles as meaningless gods. There was a great science that existed at the time of the global culture that took place thousands and thousands of years ago. Now, sadly, some people just worship these powers because they don't know how to activate them. Do you see what I'm trying to get at? That they're giving these powers names, uh, like in the religion of Santeria. Candomblé and other other religions uh, where religions where they combined indigenous beliefs often from Africa where the slaves who were brought against their will from their homes transplanted into another country and told ordered to worship a completely different pantheon, usually the Roman Catholic pantheon. And I do use the word pantheon because that's what it really comes down to, all the saints, right? These are really gods and goddesses. But what has happened is that people have forgotten how to activate these powers. 
So what they do is they still remember the names, they have their rituals, they let the gods and goddesses ride them, take possession of them. Basically speaking, activation involves taking these powers into your being. It involves understanding how these pantheons are maps of your soul. And think about it. A lot of you people out there who are very prejudiced, I do have a bone to pick with you. You, you talk about, well, hey, the, the Italians came over to, to America, and they had it rough. And the, uh, the Chinese and the Japanese, they came over to America. And the Irish, and they had it rough. They were discriminated against, but they became successful. And then you talk about, look at the people from Africa. Well, okay, let's look at the people from Africa. What happened to their culture? Now, the peoples from Ireland, the peoples from Italy, the peoples from Japan were able to keep their culture. They were able to keep their deities, to worship their deities, to talk about their deities in public. But what about the people from Africa? Were they allowed even to remember who their ancestors were? I'm, as you know, a mixture Italian, British, and probably Slavic blood. But now, those of us who have come from grandparents and great-grandparents who immigrated to the United States. Okay, they knew who their parents' names were, their grandparents' names, their great-grandparents' names, and something else that they knew. They knew what city they came from. And isn't that something that you often talk about if if you come from an immigrant family, if you can connect with someone from the same city that you can that you can, certainly you, but your your probably your grandparents or your great grandparents came from. You know this, but the people coming from Africa, they don't even know what city they came from. So really, walk a mile in their shoes before you start to put them down. Mark my words, Africa, there are many secrets still to be unveiled in Africa. We have only begun, and tonight's program with the laboratory of Enki, the city of Enki, is just a beginning of the unveiling of the great power of Africa. Now, you just can't wish these things into turning themselves on. I'm talking about the activation process. However, through techniques such as vocal sounding, you can incarnate these powers onto this plane. You have to embrace your role. Remember when we spoke about legacy? Do you want a legacy? Yes or no? This does not take a half an hour to think about. If you want a legacy, seize the day and start working. I want to bring up a very important subject. Christian books masquerading as UFO books. For a couple of decades now, the Christian writers and the evil televangelists made a ton of money writing books about the coming end of the world. They were saying that it was going to happen around the year 2000. Well, 2000 passed and we are still here. Therefore, they needed something else to write about. What have they done? I'm going to tell you right now, they have latched onto writing books about the Nephilim, Nabiru, Anunnaki, and so forth, claiming that this somehow signals that Jesus is returning. Well, beware. Beware of being ripped off. Notice, if you will, that the covers of these books are very well done talk about subtlety and conspiracy. If you do something like uh, go to Google and search, I'll say the, the best UFO books uh, for 2010. And uh, out will pop a whole bunch of readers lists from Amazon. But if you look at each and every individual book on that list, you gradually realize 
You've never heard of any of these authors. We were saying that the covers of these books are very well done. Their artists are excellent. So if you're uh, browsing in a bookstore and you happen to see a cover of one of these books, your eyes will be fascinated by it. Remember, something brilliant that Michael Tazarian has taught us is how the negative extraterrestrial warlords have used powerful images and symbols to manipulate us. And color is one of those powerful forces that can affect our unconscious minds, and in this case, into buying a book. So now, what I suggest you do, pick up one of these books. You will not find the word Christian or Jesus on the front cover, and you'll be hard-pressed to find it on the back cover. It'll probably be mentioned maybe once in small print. Know your authors before you buy books. Be careful. Do your research before you go to the bookstore. So read also a few reviews on Amazon. If you're, if you're shopping online, read the reviews. Now I know every UFO author out there has his or her enemies, okay? So don't tell me, oh, so-and-so is, don't read so-and-so. They work for the CIA or the FBI, blah, 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 blah. Every single person that is out there speaking and writing has their enemies, has people saying these things about them. But I want you to look for phrases like, quote, a Christian perspective. I don't suggest you stamp on the book in the bookstore, because then you'll have to buy it. But uh, don't just put it back as quickly as possible. It seems harmless enough, but unless you are a born-again Christian, these books are not what you're looking for. So I warn you to beware of this trick that is now being used. You, you will never in a month of, of Saturdays hear of any of these authors. The reason why you don't hear of these authors is because uh, they are writing from a born-again Christian agenda. And that is really a whole of the show. The power of collective consciousness is everywhere. And the mystery unfolds before our eyes. It's become clear that the lies and cover-ups are no longer serving societies. And it is becoming very clear that change is upon us. As I've said, it wasn't always that the majority of humanity were helpless victims at the mercy of extraterrestrial warlords. I've told you, we found out, we fought back, and we eventually won. However, the victory wasn't 100%, and it never is. Remember, if you will, the end of The Lord of the Rings. There's always got to be a balance that exists in this universe. But while evil beings occupy themselves with their evil machinations and rituals, groups of human beings gather and work their own kind of magic for the good of all humankind. These are the metaphysical freedom fighters. It is in the state of ecstasy. Not the state of New York or Pennsylvania or California, but the state of ecstasy that true changes are brought about by those who see and know. That is why we have the place inside. You are in the boot camp for the metaphysical freedom fighters. Here you will learn the secrets and mysteries of ecstasy. I will tell you frankly, if you are only interested in saving your own ass, you will actually learn less and less. But if you have feelings of compassion for your fellow brothers and sisters on this planet, for your fellow human beings, then your learning will be accelerated a hundredfold. Ask yourself honestly, what are my motivations? 
What motivates me to wake up in the morning? The world teeters on the brink. If you just want to work to eat and eat to work, then you're no better than a farm animal pulling a plow, my friend. But if you wake up to awaken others, then you are ready for the big leagues. Some masters can slow time down. Some masters can make things appear out of thin air. One example of this was a woman by the name of Helena Blavatsky. Look up that name. By her book, Isis Unveiled, it is the most astounding compendium of occult facts and theories in literature. It proclaims the existence of mystery schools. It outlines of movements by the guardians of the ancient wisdom to preserve and protect the ageless truths until in later times they would again become known for the spiritual benefit of all. Hopefully, at some time in the not too distant future, I will open a mystery school, perhaps someplace in Mexico or South America, maybe even the United States. Please stay tuned, wait and see. It is going to happen if this is the will of the ultimate reality. So what do you do and say to an extraterrestrial if you meet one expectedly or unexpectedly? Think about that. What do you do or say to an extraterrestrial if you meet one expectedly or unexpectedly? All right, I'm going to tell you. Listen very carefully. First, never Take your eyes off them. Never break eye contact. Then say, it is the manner and custom when entering my space that permission be asked. I will repeat that for you. You say to them, it is the manner and custom when entering my space that permission be asked because what you are doing is the following you are declaring your sovereignty and you are declaring your space so I want you to practice that sentence and to memorize it if you want to tweak it in some way yourself by all means do so have it memorized practice this in front of a mirror be ready to do it now Mike Hallowell wrote a great blog about skeptics and UFOs that I need to share with you he begins this way he says how can the skeptics then say that there isn't life in outer space is beyond me how could they know? Have we been visited by more advanced life forms from other worlds? The only cogent but not necessarily correct argument I've ever heard is that the vast distances between star systems would make traveling to them impossible. Okay, that, that's worth listening to and address it. But NASA and other bodies have been looking at several theoretical possibilities as to how this could be accomplished for some time. Like the warp drive, for example. The general consensus seems to be that it would be at best difficult and at worst impossible. Of course, as our knowledge of the sciences advances, History tells us that what seems impossible today may simply be difficult tomorrow. And what is difficult today may prove to be as easy as falling off a log next week. The great Stanton Friedman physicist says that interstellar travel will be easy for any civilization that has it figured out. Building airplanes and flying to Europe is easy to us. People are basically saying, if we can't do it, it's impossible. Well, that's absurd. Any pronouncement that interstellar travel will never be possible is very presumptuous indeed. Whether we have actually been visited by extraterrestrial life is another matter, of course. 
But again, how do the skeptics know? Were they personally present at every alleged UFO sighting or alien encounter? Now, I am saying this to give you information and comebacks to say to obnoxious, annoying people that you may encounter at parties and dinners and so forth. But you know my experiences and beliefs in this matter. So you can ask them, were you personally present at every UFO sighting or alien encounter? No. Therefore, they simply have no way of establishing that the witnesses were either mistaken, hallucinating, or lying. They have no way to make a conclusion like this. If interstellar travel is possible, then it is highly likely that a number of advanced civilizations have engaged in it and visited other worlds, including our own. Seen in this light, it actually makes more sense to believe in UFOs than not to. Skeptics, well, let's call the rabidly cynical ones anyway, are the first to shout, where's the evidence? When confronted with an alleged paranormal encounter, they're missing the point. How many skeptics out there have evidence that they ate breakfast yesterday? Ask them. None. More than likely. But we'd have no reason to disbelieve them. They might even have the eyewitness testimony of their spouse, their boyfriend, their girlfriend, their dog, who shared breakfast with them. Skeptics would argue that eating breakfast is a mundane event which is perfectly believable, while claiming you've seen an extraterrestrial craft and its occupants is not. Actually, what this demonstrates is not that UFO sightings are false, but that the skeptics just don't possess the vision to accept they might be true. The witnesses were there at the time. The skeptics were not. I can sympathize with moderate skeptics who do not accept the existence of UFOs, but who at least reach their conclusions after a period of sober reflection and, and research. Unfortunately, the rabid skeptics out there aren't satisfied with this. And for some reason, they feel this intense need. It's, it's really um, neurotic to decry those who claim to have seen UFOs and call them cranks and those who believe in UFOs and, and call them idiots. Why? Let me tell you, deep, deep down, they're scared. They're scared that we really have been visited by alien life forms and so enter a state of denial which they reinforce by launching vicious personal attacks on anyone who thinks differently. That way they can kid themselves that there are no UFOs and that there's nothing at all to worry about. If the only way they can maintain their shaky stance is by heaping abuse on those who think differently, then I pity them. On the website topsecret.com, uh, Arbitrager makes an incredibly insightful point. He writes, What if the ugliest aliens we can imagine are highly spiritually evolved and or actually benevolent? According to Edgar Cayce, the Arcturians are the most highly evolved beings and people who have claimed to have encounters with them say they aren't pretty. Hollywood may be part of the anti-disclosure program to keep humans scared of any creature that does not resemble an earthling. If we are scared of them, chaos will ensue, causing us not only to hurt them, but possibly hurt ourselves as well. 
truly benevolent beings would not want to risk that happening. So in order to keep our society functioning, they may not reveal themselves, at least on a global level, for everybody's own safety. Now I realize that during tonight's program that I have made a few mistakes in uh, words that I have mispronounced and so forth. And that makes me think of something that I, I want to urge those of you, my, my younger listeners in, in, in particular out there, don't always be looking for someone who is 100% perfect you're going to get yourself into a lot of trouble that way because no human being on this earth is 100% perfect. What I have learned in my life is this. Don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Everyone has their, their foibles. Everyone has uh, what's called their Achilles heel some some problem uh, or other that they face in their life okay but that is not reason to completely reject totally all of their teachings their writings so forth and so on I remember when I was a young man that if I found out that someone who I was studying with or whose books I was reading had one fault, I would completely reject this individual, stop reading their books, and have nothing further to do with them. Well, life does not work like that. You have to use your own best judgment, please, when dealing with other human beings. Like I say, do not throw the baby out with the bath water. People have some very valuable things to say. Listen, okay? As uh, the saying goes, take what you need and leave the rest. That's all I want to say about that. But getting back to the um, various races of uh, extraterrestrials and how they look. Now, it, it is an absolute fact that some of the greatest human beings have not been the most attractive physically in the Hollywood sense of the term. One of the greatest theologians, uh, his name was Thomas Aquinas, was actually thought to be severely learning disabled and he had the appearance of someone with an extremely low IQ and uh, he was actually asked to leave school and all this while he is one of the most intelligent, insightful human beings who have ever walked the face of the earth. And not that I'm recommending you go out and read the works of Thomas Aquinas, but I'm just saying that don't look for Hollywood beauty to, to give some kind of proof to you that someone is speaking wisdom, all right? That's a big problem you see now that we have uh, YouTube. You have these people come out. That some of them are like great comedians. They'll, they'll do an hour of stand-up before they actually get to talking about extraterrestrials. They're great comedians. But what does that have to do with extraterrestrials and their, their knowledge or lack of it about the subject? And so it, it continues. There are, there are people who are attractive physically in the Hollywood sense of the term, um, but actually when push comes to shove, they know very little about the actual subject of life in other parts of the universe. Again, I must point out, as there is so much gossip out there and so much jealousy, that I am not a Catholic, I am not a Christian, although I do believe in the ultimate reality. 
I believe that Jesus was a great master. I also believe Muhammad was a master. Other masters that have visited Earth include Krishna, Viracocha in South America. If you want to read more about Viracocha, please read Graham Hancock's Fingerprints of the Gods. Other great masters, Mani, Zarathustra. These are names you need to know and you need to read their writings. You need to build up your metaphysical muscles just as much as you need to build up your physical muscles. You must develop your sense of intuition. Some call this your awareness or consciousness so that you can sense when a being has negative vibrations or positive vibrations. Now, I hope you've been doing your mantra because I want to give you your second mantra now during tonight's program. It should be done the same way as you did the first mantra. Drop using the first mantra and now focus on the new mantra. This will be the second mantra I'm giving you. I want you to begin experimenting not only saying it silently to yourself, but I want you to, when you are in a private place or a quiet place like your car, start vocalizing your mantra. Don't demand of me specifics. Specifics are for losers. People who are afraid of blowing up the laboratory. People afraid of getting a speeding ticket. You must experiment how the mantra interacts with your biology and breath through vocalizing, otherwise known as singing these mantras. You don't have to be a musician, all right? Get that idea out of your head. Some people, it has been said, like the people who take ayahuasca in the Amazon, will actually create ayahuasca songs. And they find that the ingestion of entheogens helps with creating these magical songs. I am just reporting this interesting anthropological fact to you. Chant the mantra. Turn up your car stereo to maximum volume to your favorite song and just sing the mantra to the rhythm of the beat. Listen for the bass. Feel the bass groove. Try to match the words to the notes that the bass is playing. If you can't do that, fine. Don't worry about it. But try making your voice into a rhythm instrument. If you've rapped, this will be easy. And use the mantra and make it into a percussion instrument. Do you see how powerful rap music could be if only it were used for alchemical rap instead of gangster rap or talking about money, women, and guns, and of course, what else? Gold. It is very interesting. I want to bring out the fact that this is the second mantra. If you are not doing the first mantra, that means that you have missed the program that I gave out the first mantra. So you have to go back and listen to previous programs. We're only up to what? Episode 9 right now. So that's not too much work to do. But you have to do this work in the sequence that I am giving to you. So now I am sure you are anxious to receive your second mantra. Your second mantra is as follows. My life force. My life force. My life force. That is your second mantra. And so ends the transmission for June 9th, 2011. We will be in contact soon.